Hello and welcome to worship at Covenant Presbyterian Church. This is the worship service for July 26th, 2020. I'm Pastor Jeff Foxkline, and I'm so thrilled that you're able to join us for worship in whatever space you're in. I hope you can find a way to make yourself comfortable. Maybe if you're wearing shoes, take off your shoes because the place where you are is holy ground. Because this is worship. This is worship together. Wherever we are, we are here together, bound by the great spirit of Jesus Christ who calls us to worship and serve and love. We've got a great worship service for you today. I'm very excited for this. We're continuing our series on the little books of the Bible. This week's book is on Colossians, which um, I didn't know before I chose to preach on Colossians, but I can't spell it. In case you're wondering, it's just one L and two S's. I don't know, I keep putting in like seven L's and a thousand S's, it just doesn't work. Regardless, Colossians is a good book. I'm glad you're here to worship with us. I'm really excited for the day and I, I hope that we find ourselves together again um, in person. Um, but in the meantime, I'm so glad to be here with you virtually. Let us begin our worship. Let us pray. Gracious God, today we come giving you praise and thanksgiving for all you have given us, but how often we take it all for granted. We fail to acknowledge the love and care of those closest to us. We go on with our lives assuming the grocery store will be open and television stations broadcasting. We are so focused on our own needs that we do not recognize those of others. Open us up that we may express our gratitude to those we love and those who serve us. Open us up that we may serve others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brothers and sisters, 
Our God is a gracious God. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us share the peace of Christ with one another in spoken word and written word with all that we meet this coming week. The peace of Christ be with you. Hi, Dr. Nick. Hi, Guy. Hi, everyone. Hi, Brooke. Should we say hi to all the kids? Hi, hi kids. kids. Hi, kids. Well, kids, I'm sure glad that you're able to join us today. And, and Brooke and Guy, thank you for joining us as well. I'm glad that we could come together to learn a little bit about the Bible. Yes, Dr. Nick. I'm so excited. I've been getting ready to present to the kids. And I'm trying to do it right. I know it's a rule that I'm supposed to sit up straight. Kids, look how straight I'm sitting up. I'm sitting up a lot straighter than Brooke. You know, Guy, you are sitting up pretty straight. I, I, I guess I agree with that. I know that the adults are supposed to read Colosseans, a Bible birth. A verse from the Bible. Is this verse we are reading today? Yes, it is, Brooke. And I even read the Bible verse, too. Dr. Nick, I know that it's a rule that we are supposed to read the Bible. You know, I don't think Brooke read the Bible verse. I sure am doing better than Brooke for this children's sermon. Well, you know, Guy, I, I sure appreciate that you read the Bible verse. Um, and you know, that is one of the rules, one of the things that we try to work on, but do you remember what the Bible verse was about? I didn't really understand it. Well, Guy, this Bible verse was about one of the times where sometimes we follow rules, but we follow rules for the wrong reasons. You know, instead of following the rules for the reasons that we should follow rules for. How can you follow our rules for the wrong reasons? Well, now let's think about it. Let's, let's use an example from today. Well, maybe the kids can help. Kids, were there, there any rules that we talked about today that maybe one of the two of us or one of the three of us was following? Well, Guy talked about sitting up straight. Well, Guy did talk about sitting up straight. That's right. Yes, and Brooke talked about how we are supposed to read the Bible. That's right. And, and another rule, something that we're supposed to do, is we're supposed to read the Bible. And so those are reasons that people are following the rules. And so do you feel like you two were following those rules? Yes. Yeah, I think so too. I think you guys were following the rules. But were you doing it for the right reasons? Why were you following the rules, Guy? I guess I was just following the rules to try and look better than Brooke for this children's sermon. I'm sorry, Brooke. I wasn't very polite. I forgive you, Guy. Well, you know, Guy, I think you're right. You know, you were, I think you were following the rules, but you were doing it for the wrong reason. But I was really impressed that you guys also followed some of the other rules of the Bible. And you know what some of those were? Like, you were very humble there, Guy. And, Brooke, you showed forgiveness. Those are both some rules of the Bible that you two followed. And you followed them for the right reasons. So I think we can realize that sometimes we can follow the rules for the wrong reasons, which is what we shouldn't do. So you're saying that we should follow the rules, but we should do it for the right reason. The reason that Jesus taught us. That's exactly right, Guy. And so we're supposed to follow the rules for the right reasons. We're supposed to follow the rules, the rules that Jesus taught us, so that we can make our soul stronger and that we can love one another better. So let's say a little prayer about that. Will you help Guy with his prayer hands there, Brooke? Thank you. And so let's all bow our head. Lord, thank you for letting us understand the importance of both rules, but also living our lives for the right reasons. And let us move forward in love and understanding and humility and compassion. And now let's all switch over and we'll say the Lord's Prayer together, the whole congregation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, well, thanks, kids. Thanks, Guy. Thanks, Brooke. Bye, everybody. Bye. We love because God first loved us. We love because God first loved us. We love, we love, we love because God first loved us. Something is amiss in Colossae, and Paul is just not having it. There's false teachings and philosophy and Christians being led astray by unsound doctrine. And Paul just cannot stand it. So he does what anyone would do. He writes a letter. And so this is the book of Colossians. It's this letter about this unsound doctrine, this philosophy that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. It's four chapters long, very short, and it's one of our little books that we've been doing for our little books with big impact series all through the summer. And Paul starts, this is, I think, just one of the most beautiful things that he's written. He starts with this wonderful hymn to God, and I'm going to read you a passage from it. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Now that is a stunning ode to Jesus Christ, an affirmation of sound doctrine, a thesis statement for what it means to be a Christian. Frankly, it's some major credentialing that he does up front. You can't read what he says there and, and pretend that he's anything but an expert in Christianity. And then he goes on to say in Colossians chapter 2, verse 4, he gives you the reason why he's writing it. Here's what he says. I am saying this so that no one may deceive you with plausible arguments. He sets himself up in order to show that those who are peddling in philosophy are not nearly up to the standard that Paul holds himself. And then all of this leads up to this wonderful statement that I think is just a, a great emphasis of this book. Colossians chapter 2 verses 20 through 23 says, If you... If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? All of these regulations refer to things that perish with use. They are simply human commands and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom, in promoting self-imposed piety, humility, and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value in checking self-indulgence. Paul wants you to know, and he wants to make sure you know, appearances don't matter. Rather, it's the substance that matters. So, for example, I'm wearing a suit right now, and I think that lends quite an appearance of authority to me, if I do say so myself. But the legitimacy of this jacket actually hides the fact that I am wearing shorts and sandals. So, you know, the appearance of wisdom really sometimes just is that. And that's a tricky part of the puzzle here. The biggest problem in all of this uh, is that the philosophy that Paul is railing against, it doesn't seem all that bad. It's not encouraging human sacrifice or anything. It's not armed insurrection. It's, it's, it's reasonable. And it's not wholly uncontroversial. But that's the insidiousness of it. 
It comes to the church in Colossae cloaking itself with the appearance of reasonableness. But it's not. It's regulations, it's rules, it's, it's laws that exist without a greater purpose, designed based on the laws of the world to apply to the people of the world. It's designed not with the kingdom of God in mind, but with the world as its focus. And just because something appears reasonable or legitimate does not make it so. This past week, I've been thinking a lot about Congressman John Lewis, um, who died just a little over a week ago. I've been thinking about his life and his legacy and the legacy he left for our country. I've also been thinking about the forces that he spent his life fighting against. The forces of authority that were given the appearance of legitimacy, given the, the appearance of wisdom. And I think of the ways that those forces used the trappings of their offices and positions to unleash pain on people that society deemed less legitimate at the time. And it was really only after that power was abused so egregiously on that bloody Sunday on the Edmund Pettus Bridge did it become widely apparent the extent of the illegitimacy of that power and authority. Because the appearance of legitimacy can be downright dangerous. It was dangerous for John Lewis, who was left with a fractured skull. It's still dangerous today. It was dangerous when police beat peaceful protesters with nightsticks for, for protesting. And it is dangerous when federal agents pull people into unmarked vehicles for unknown reasons. When something looks official or looks legitimate but doesn't seem to be acting in that way, when something, as Paul would say, has the appearance of wisdom, that's the time, friends. That is the time when we need to ask the most questions of it. And so the, this fallacy of, of a legitimate seeming philosophy, once it becomes obvious to us, what, what then should we do? How should we respond? Paul gives us a sense of what it is that we should do to exhibit true piety and faith. In fact, Paul spells it out explicitly. Listen to this in, in Colossians 3, chapter 12 through 14. Listen to how the faithful live, legitimate wisdom. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Friends, this is not the appearance of piety. It's not some visible authoritative view of what could be legitimate or right. It's a surrender to the working of the Holy Spirit. It's a recognition that our legitimacy, that our wisdom is not tied to this world, is not tied to the regulations and rules of this world, but is rather tied to our devotion to God and through that, our devotion to our neighbor. Because, let's face it, compassion is not going to make us famous. Kindness is frowned upon. Humility is not going to give us any success. Meekness it might as well be just surrendering to your enemies, just taking the loss. And patience, well, that, that's well outside of our list of national virtues. And love? Oh, jeez. Don't get me started. Love is weakness. Love is vulnerability. Love is kind of just a bad idea if you're trying to make it in the world. You see, the, the fancy nature of our clothing is nothing 
if it isn't undergirded by those things that make us truly great. Because how we appear, what we look like, what we wear, it, it doesn't matter. Our appearances don't matter. The appearance of wisdom will always fall flat in the face of the truly great garments, true wisdom. It's in wearing these garments that we reflect the real nature of Christ, who is our head. Christ, whose wisdom and power came in the paradox of the upside-down kingdom. And you see, compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and love, all of those are about how we relate to each other. The appearance of wisdom cares about ourself, about our own authority, about our legitimacy, about the way we look to other people. But the things that Paul's talking about, compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, patience, love, these, these are only about the way in which we care about other people. So the world keeps saying, me, 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 but Paul is saying, no, true wisdom, real wisdom is us, is you, is we together. And hopefully, over a long enough timeline, these characteristics will be acknowledged as the true wisdom that they are. Hopefully, over a long enough timeline, the folly of worldly wisdom, of improperly imparted authorities, and of feigned legitimacy will come crashing down against a tidal wave of compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and centrally, most importantly, above all else, that it comes crashing against a wave of love. Amen. Friends, during this time of offering, we recognize that all that we have, all that we've earned is a gift from God and a gift meant to be shared. As such, you are welcome to give thoughtfully and generously of your time, your talent, and your resources to the ministry and mission of Covenant Presbyterian Church, especially as we continue to think about how to make creative and connective ministry together right now. You're also invited to give to our COVID-19 relief fund. That's a partnership with area organizations to offer help and relief during this time. You can give by check or online. And either way that you give, how you give, we recognize and give thanks for our ability to offer ourselves and our resources generously, recognizing that we are all connected, we all belong to one another, and that this offering does indeed help change the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.
The Bible encourages us to love one another and to pray for one another. So with the help of our prayer list, we pray for each other and we care for each other and we show our love for one another. You can get a copy of the prayer list through the church office. New on the prayer list this week, Covenant member Ernie Madsen, who is recuperating at home. Gail and Francis Baptist, the sister and brother-in-law of Covenant member Jan Minardi. Ermina Wavra, the mother of Nancy McCulley. And Kathy Mose and her son Micah. Micah is recuperating after a bout of COVID-19. Today we have a white rose in the chancel area commemorating the life of Chris Castell, the wife of Louis Madsen and the daughter-in-law of Ernie and Helen Madsen. Chris died suddenly, unexpectedly this past week, so our prayers are with the Madsen family. And we want to offer our congratulations and best wishes to Jim and Carol Ruley, longtime Covenant members who celebrated their 50th anniversary this past week. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me now in prayer. Loving God, thank you for the gift of this new day. Thank you for the promise and possibility of today. Wake us up. Keep us alert to the world around us. Help us to make the most of the time that you've given us. We rejoice in the beauty of creation. Help us to notice the simple things today. Help us to see your love in the world around us. We pray, O oh God, for our world. We pray for people who are hungry, for people who live amidst warfare and injustice. We pray that you would help us to take better care of the planet you've entrusted to our care. We pray for the city of Madison and for our homes wherever it is that we live. We pray that you'll help us to work together for the common good, to solve problems together, to love our neighbors. We pray, O oh God, for our elected leaders. Give them wisdom, common sense, compassion. Help them find ways to work together for the common good. Help us all, God, to join forces, to work together, to do what we can together to make this world a better place. We pray for doctors and nurses and researchers and all the medical people who are working on the virus situation. And we pray for those who are caring for our loved ones who are sick. Give them wisdom and perseverance. Thank you, God. We pray for one another. We pray for our friends, for our family, for our church, for ourselves. You have called us through Jesus Christ to be your people, to love our neighbors, to make a difference in the world. Give us wisdom and strength and compassion. Help us to keep supporting and encouraging one another as we journey forward as your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
And so, friends, as we depart for this day, as our worship concludes, as we wrap up with this worship and continue our worship in the world, remember that it's not the appearance of wisdom that matters. How you look, what other people think of you, how the world perceives you, that's not what's important. And when something looks like it's trying too hard to be authority, question it. Try the spirits. Look for the appearance of wisdom. Because true wisdom will always give the lie to that false legitimacy. And as we go, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has complaint against one another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.